<laughs> well, we'll be looking at the bodies in Callahallen and, um, and South Uist, the island of South Uist. And the, the, for, for you, Ellen, only for you, uh, the, these, are, these are the Hebrides, and we are going to be looking at this site here. Um, and within this landscape here, we know of, of hundreds and hundreds of, of sites going way back into probably as far as the Mesolithic period. But the site that we're going to look at today, um, is, is, this has gone down really well this week. It probably won't to go down very well in front of you guys. So you're constantly interrupted, particularly Dennis, right? Um, and, um, but we've got, we got a lot to go through yeah, using um, a small amount of information, um, which helps us um, to elaborate um, the wonderful finds that have been made here. We've got uh, uh, evidence of mummification. Uh, <coughs> and the archaeologist that we refer to today is an archaeologist that I absolutely detest. Um, a, a certain Professor Mike Parker Pearson. However, for once, I actually agree with him on something. Yay! He's the man who believes that, that stones at Stonehenge were walked all the way from West Wales uh, over the course of 500 years, um, sort of walking all the way to the top of the Brecon Beacons, all the way back down again, up through the Black Mountains, all the way back around again, all the way around, all the way, and ended up at Stonehenge, right? Um, and he, he, he would stand here in this room and uh, convince you that that's what happened. I, I don't like the guy, but with, he was the guy who excavated at this site. Um, and thanks to him, we, we find out that we've got um, evidence of mummification, not in the Roman period, but in the Bronze Age. However, when you think about evidence for mummification, we do now actually have evidence in the Roman period of mummification also, don't we, Alan? Thank yes. you very much. Um, so... When we think about mummification in this case, um, it's, it's made us understand that in the Bronze Age, mummification was a lot wider spread than we ever believed or ever thought um, in the Bronze Age. Um, and bit by bit, um, we're, we're slowly understanding our, our prehistoric landscape. But in regards to Orkney, with, with new information all the time in regards to all this stuff, um, we, we're, only, we're only touching um, the top of the iceberg, as it were, but we know so much more about the prehistoric period within this wonderful landscape of Britain um, and within the wonderful landscape of Scotland than, than we ever did 10, 20 years ago. So to sort of give you a little bit of an idea, and what we're going to do, this is highly based today um, on, on old, um, old press cuttings and old press releases. So... Um, well, when I say old press releases, 2011, 2015. So look at this one here. Um, and this brings us the, the fascinating... Um, Is that Dennis? Yeah, yeah and, and notice what's wrong with the, with the hands. The person who drew this... Um, oh, it's in the two right yeah. hands. Yeah. Exactly, so then it's sort of not really accurate there. Um, but but what, what we've got, we, we've got um, a set of human remains that has been excavated, one of four um, sets of mummified remains that have been excavated, and this is a schematic plan. So originally the person was crouched, right, is it in a crouched burial um, in the kist below the house. However, they flexed it out. Hang on, they flexed it out. This is not how she's buried. This is a schematic plan. They flexed the body out to tell us the bones that were present um, at point of burial, which is basically um, the entire body that was found. Um, and the important point is, is that this part of the body dates approximately to 1,600 years BC. This part of the body dates to 1,500 years BC. And the jawbone itself dates, if you want to look, are approximately 1,450 years BC, meaning that this female was made up of three separate individuals at point of burial. And if you look at the dates there, there's, if you want to put this into the, 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 uh, the um, extent, this body is around 300 years old at point of burial with the composite parts. Now that is really, really important. Now what I'd like to do is so that I can get the colour right in this. Um, I'm going to change. They're not too. Oh, you yeah. do the hands are two left hands. They like that. Yeah, that's right. No, no, it's the way. No, no. 
people, people, people. It's a schematic plan. The archaeologists. I get that, have... but they're, they're not to their hands drawn on it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, the, yeah, I know. It's the, 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 the archaeologists have made a mistake. The person was buried with a right and a left. No, you're not listening. I am. In the schematic, no, if you look at all the other bones, they actually drawn it like that. Yeah, the bones are all twisted. The around. bones are, are that way round. If you go back and look at them. We will have a look now. Oh, okay. The forearm bones. Are yeah, all right. the bones. The forearm, and you can see the knuckle bones. Yeah, that's 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 oh, right. Oh my God, I've got a memory lead. Okay. <laughs> you got a memory lead. Can I have it? <laughs> if you, if you right, so what, 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 are you, what are you blabbering on about? Right, look at the arm, the actual forearm. They're mm -hmm. like that. That's why the thumbs are both the same size, is because they're, they're, the hands are turned up the other way. Because that's twisted, the ulna yeah. and the um, yeah. radius yeah. is yeah. twisted. They're yeah. like that. Yeah. Your arms are... are yeah, but I. But what? Yeah, I, I know, but this I know is that's not how they were buried. Yeah, yeah. But they haven't drawn two left hands. Right. Okay. So they've drawn a left and a right one. Yeah. And then turned the arm. Turned the arm around. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. I do understand what you're talking about now. But what? What it is? This. This is no. Bears no relevance to the body that was excavated. It's just showing you the bones that were present. Right. So, yeah. That's Probably that's the point I'm trying to make. The, the, the front of the hand. Yeah, I think it's the front of the hand. It, it might be, but let, just stop, stop, Why stop. Why is it Stop, stop, stop. Well, there must be a reason he did it. But it's not relevant. It's really not relevant today. It's fine. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, not, it's not relevant to what we're doing. We've completely gone off track. We've got to get back on track. Right. Okay, so um, the, the whole point of this is, is that the body's been buried over a long period of time. Now, um, if, you, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the feet and the hands, the tassels and the carpels, what you will realise um, is that they are all present, all the digits are present. Right? Now, now this is really key, this is really important. This body, this body, date, this part of the body itself, dating back to 1,600 years BC, 3,600 years ago, um, this, this body, um, to, for these bones, these smaller bones, to have actually survived um, nearly 300 years at point of burial must have meant that these were bound together because there is no practical way in archaeology that these, these digits can actually survive out of ground for that period of time without being scavenged, without eroding away and so on and so on. Um, so that is the point of this schematic plan to actually show that everything is more or less present. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to go into the whys and wherefore alls. Hmm? <laughs> 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 one way to shut him up. <laughs> 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 moving as well. <laughs> uh, we're going to look at the... Oh, I've forgotten where we are now. I can have that right. And now I've lost the image. <coughs> we can remember it. Yeah. Oh my God. Alan, Alan, it's the first time you've ever been a... <laughs> a nuisance. Alan, usually you're very helpful. You help me with my bags, right? You're a proper creep. And today you have really put your foot in it. Uh, feet in it, there you go. So, right, moving on again. So, the, the, the site at Callahallan that um, they, they've ex they excavated... Um, three buildings, and within uh, one building there, one building there, there's one building out of shot. And when they excavated these buildings, um, they, they could have just stopped at the ground level. But as they started to go through the ground level, they found um, up to six sets of remains. And one of these sets of remains happened to be a dog. Um, but we're going to focus on the human remains. We're going to focus not on, not on the um, five sets of human remains. We're going to um, focus on... The, the two sets of human remains that are made up of composite parts of individuals uh, that, that, um, that are dedicated to um, these people that actually built these structures in the first place. So the point being made here is that these buildings here, these three buildings in a row, a nice little terrace, around here as well, um, they, they, they've obviously excavated this, so the, the, gra the, the, the way you're looking at um, this landscape would have been completely different in the past. So but this is the excavated area, and the reason why they found these buildings in the first place was that they were extracting for sand. Now, the bearing of the sand on this is that the 
As the buildings were abandoned, the sand blew in and actually covered the remains. At the point that these buildings uh, were being occupied, uh, it was not within a sandy sand dune, for example. So that does not have an effect on the sets of human remains buried there. So don't think of certain who or anything else like that. Now, when we're, when we're thinking about the sets of human remains at this site, we've got to think about... Um, We've got to think about the, the, the type of context and the type of thinking that these people would have had thousands of years ago. For example, do we not, Cathy, when you go to read up about West Kennet Long Barrow, they will tell you about West Kennet Long Barrow being constructed, and there are human remains in, that were found, originally found in West Kennet Long Barrow that predated the construction of the barrow in the first place, which is quite strange. And the reason why that is, is that people would have carried human remains around with them uh, for a long period of time before they placed them in these types of burial chambers, uh, or chambers, as I like to refer to them. The case of Carl is, is very, very different from something like a burial chamber. Um, this, this is a Bronze Age site. Um, it's slightly after the period of those burial chambers. And these sets of human remains are left outside the ground, outside the place of burial, for hundreds of years before they are deposited, uh, where they were eventually found by archaeologists not so many years ago. Um, and this, this sense of um, going around with um, your ancestors, going around with loved ones, going around with members of your family, going around with special people or non-special people, whoever these people were, is not an unknown phenomenon. Uh, for those that will understand the Inca Mambos, um, that when you go around the landscape uh, of the in Incan sort of trail, you'll see the long roads, um, and there's these buildings. And inside these buildings, there's these niches. And what you would do, me and Alan, right, we've decided to go into the interior um, of the Incan world to see if we can find some lost Roman treasures. He's convinced me of that. He, he just wants to go on the, on, the, on the razzle. Anyway, so one night, me and you, Alan, we, we've got to stay in these Mambo buildings, right? We're going to stay in them, right? And it's only you and I, and there's somebody looking after the building. And the first thing they ask, how many are you? Alan's decided to bring his uncle with us, okay? His uncle um, is strapped um, to the side of the llama, right? Um, in one of the panniers, um, the answer is three. So, Alan, go and get your uncle. We put the uncle in the niche, right? And we nicely go to sleep. In the morning, we ask our uncle his advice on where we're going to go next. We have something to eat. We slap, we slap, we strap um, Alan's um, uncle into one of the panniers and we go on with our wonderful day, right? There's three of us, right? Because our uncle is important to us, isn't he, Alan? Oh, yes. Very important. And that's not unusual in society where we, tra where we travel around um, with our loved ones. In the Victorian period, um, people kept um, the deceased hair with them. Um, and there, there are various other bits and pieces that are carried around with people in the Victorian world. And it's not unusual in the Egyptian world. For example, a few, year, a few years ago, um, um, somebody offered me some um, Egyptian mummified fingers in a, in a little box, right? Um, and they, they were, these, mum, these fingers were mummified separately, right? Would the Egyptians have used that as some kind of um, memory for people um, in the past? Would they have been buried, whatever? But the fact of the matter is that... Um, yeah, exactly. And why not? No. And why not? But, but any, anyway, it, it, it's, it's a sense of connection with an individual. Right? And the way, the way I explain this um, is, say, say for example, um, uh, this is going to touch upon some of you. Um, you, you. Somebody has passed away, and you go to their place of burial, um, or where the cremation urn is, and you go there, and you have a conversation. You say, well... Well, in my case, it would be my granddad. So I'd uh, sit there and say, look, granddad, right, I've met this wonderful woman. Should I have anything to do with her? And you sat there thinking, what would granddad say? Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, thanks, granddad. And you go off and, and uh, uh, you start a relationship with this woman. Or you, you go to my grandmother and you say, Nan, um, 
What do you think about investing um, in, in a bet to say that the Labour Party is going to win this election? And my man would say, right, don't go and bet. So I wouldn't put the bet on, right? So in other words, you're actually communicating with these, the, those people with those conversations that you've already had with them years ago, right? That sense of connection, right? And the difference is it's a gravestone or a plaque rather than the body that you've got sitting in your house. That's the only difference. How many of us have got cremational urns um, of their loved ones in our homes? Probably quite a few of us. Um, and sometimes you get those cremational urns out and you talk to them, right? You have that conversation. It's no different from having a set of mummified remains in your house. In modern day society in the West, it's, it's not acceptable. Um, um, but uh, to other cultures that are still around us today, it is acceptable. It's, it's, it's part of their culture. So what I'd like to do is, is actually, I'd like to get straight down to the undies, right? And I think what it was, um, you know, Lynn, Lynn was having a wicked way earlier on, you know, and it, Alan, she got at you to, to push that thing there, Alan, right? In, in energy, uh, you know, she, Spell. yeah, Lynn's on a broomstick flying around and she just wanted to be in the room. Um, Chris, I had to mention Lynn, otherwise she'd feel that she's not wanted and loved. Um, so right, what I've got to do now, I've got to try, uh, where's the thing? Hang on. I don't know, it's gone somewhere. Oh, hang on, if I do, oh, hang on, if I do that, then, where have I gone? Right, there she is. There's that wonderful lady, one of the, well, one of the bodies buried at Kalahari. You can, you can see, you can see, there she is. And I know, okay, Chris, enlarge it and make it a bit more clear. Okay, Chris, I'm listening to you. Thank you. Right, thank you. See, me, what did me and Chris do? We just communicated, right? And Chris didn't say anything, right? Fantastic. So, so what we're going to do, um, nothing's going to happen to Chris, but if it does, we'll mummify him, we'll have him in the side of the room. Right? <laughs> you up for that, Chris? Job done, at least you're going to be with us every week. Can you tea? There we go. Sorted. Right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to go through. I'm going to. Um, I've got an article of the week in front of me. I'm going to read that out with this image behind us, with the, with the wonders of technology. Actually, do you know what's, what's actually happened? I should be thanking Lynn. Right. I should be thanking Lynn. And the reason why I should be thanking Lynn is meant that I've got two screens. One that you can look at an image on the screen, um, and the other one I can read. Right. So here we go. I'm just going to try and. Um, what are you talking about? The people that have got the white um, U-shaped thingies in front of their hands, the head of the skull, which sort of comes out from their eyes. That's a hand. Is it? Yeah, that's one of her hands. Uh, yeah. uh, she looks like that. That's a hand. She's, go she's going... Uh, tack of the vapours. Yeah, <laughs> can, tack of the vapours, yeah. So do, you, do, you know, do you know, I have, I have fainting spells, and, and I went into my doctor one day, and he said, oh, you know these fainting spells, right? When, when, when you're having a fainting spell and you need to go down, just go into your acting thing and go, oh, sorry, just go down on the floor. So that's what happens every time. Oh. Right, so did anyway, you, carry on. Did they lose the original head? You thought, well, we'll find another one. Ah, no, 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 no. You, 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 you're moving too far ahead of yourself, yeah. okay? <coughs> so what we're, what we're talking... So what we're, what we're talking about, um, Frankenstein's bog mummies discovered in Scotland. So um, this is the headlines. Um, two ancient bodies made from six people, new study reveals. We've got four bodies that are mummified, but we've got two bodies in particular that are made up um, of two individuals made up of, of, of six individuals altogether, which date um, from an interesting time span. So in other words, it's not sort of, um, Keith, what we're going to do, right? Yeah, my head. You and Chris are dead, yeah. right? Yeah. Think of it, right? You and Chris are dead, right? Got a similar head, right? Yeah. That's yeah. so all we're going to do. Both handsome heads. We're going to get rid of your head, right? Yeah. We're going to put your head on his body. Yeah. Right? Nothing personal. Oh, you've got a lovely body there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, um, I, don't, I don't like his jaw on your body, so what we're going to do, um, yours will fit nicely, right? So now you're dead, so put your jaw in there, job done. Uh, and then what we'll do, you put, we'll put you in a bog, right? It didn't happen that way, right? It didn't happen that way at all. These people are in different times in history, right? So you've died at one stage, 100 years, you've died. Um, 50, 60 years on, you've died. So what we've done, uh, we've, we've, we've had a Frankenstein effect on the body. However, for 100 years, 
this beast was all alone with his head, right? So his arm. With his head. So, so, so what we need to do, we need to go for a little bit more of the process with this, but before we get too excited. So in a eureka moment, worthy of Dr. Frankenstein, scientists have discovered that two, three thousand plus year old Scottish bog bodies are actually made from the remains of six people. It took the archaeologists a while to work that one out. And why? It's quite simple, right? It's quite simple. It's quite simple. And the reason why... I haven't got Pete to tell you to be quiet today. Uh, uh, we've, got to be, we've got to be quite simple. Is that when you find sets of human remains, right, you always expect those sets of human remains to be made up of one person, right? So it's going to be difficult to try for the archaeologist's mindset to move, right? So the archaeologists are looking at a body and they're saying, right, that's from one period in time. Uh, and so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, for the archaeologists to then detect that there, there are slight sort of uh, irregularities between the mandible <coughs> um, lining up with the, with the teeth above, right? The archaeologist, the, what the archaeologist wants to do, he wants to get his job done. He wants to write a report. Um, he wants to maybe rebury those human remains. That's it, move on to something else. But in this case, the bodies were in a very sta strange state of preservation, Right? Keith, they were mint. Mm. Right? But Keith, sorry, I'm picking on you again. Mm. I can't pick on Dennis because I pick on him every Tuesday, right? Yeah. Um, he gets a real gr grilling, particularly when he's got women there who's, who he's got the hots for. Right, so Keith, right? So we're going to have two Keiths, right? Yeah. One Keith and two Keith, right? So your bacteria, the, your, your gut, your, your bacteria in your gut itself, right? You, you, you're now dead, Keith, yeah. right? Yeah. Probably have your head up to make it look better. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're now dead, and the first thing that, the first thing that the bacteria in your gut um, starts to go into, um, go, go travel all around your body, right? Into your veins and stuff, it, it, all the acids sort of flow all over, and then that sort of, the lining then, it cuts through the lining, and then that goes, it starts to eat away at bone, right? The bacteria starts to eat away at your bone. We're going to bury you, Keith, into the ground, right? Yeah. Um, it's 3,600 years on, right? There's hardly anything left of your body. There might okay. be a bit of, um, there, there might teeth. be something with yeah. teeth, yeah? And that's it. Your body's basically done, right? But we've got another Keith, right? Yeah. Um, we've got another Keith. And that Keith itself, we've decided to get you in the bog straight away, Keith, right? Stick you in the bog, right? Um, and, and the process then is to stick you in the bog and three, four, ten, fifteen months later we've got to get you out the bog, right? Um, we've got to wrap all your digits and everything, your whole body into some um, kind of um, garment, right? To keep everything together, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to keep you in the home for a hundred years. And then something happens with your head. That's another bit of the story. We'll go on to that a bit in a, oh. in a short while, right? Well, go into it, that in a short while. The head goes. Uh, but anyway, the point is you can't put Peter's body in the bog for too long. And the reason why, the acids in the bog will, will eat away at the calcium, meaning that we will lose your bones, but your, your flesh will be nicely tanned and all the rest of it, right? Uh, it'll be like a good old solid whiskey, right? All, all, all your flesh will be there, right? But you'll have no structure to your body. She'll be this... Um, dribbling idiot. Wibbly right? wobbly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what's happening is that suddenly Keith's head disappears. But sorry, Keith, right? Paul Yorick, under there. We're going to keep that for a while, okay? Yeah. Put it back on now. Job right. right, anyway, um, I would usually give Keith a round of applause, but he gets very annoying at the end of a lecture when he says, yeah. That's a good bit of acting on my part. It, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was. Um... According to new isotopic date dating and DNA ex ex experiments, the mummies, a male and a female, were assembled from various body parts, although the purpose of the gruesome composites is likely lost to history. Um, and we, we, what we could be looking about, what is, you know, is, it's likely that the skulls themselves, the skull itself, to have a matched lower mandible, is, is probably from the, the same sort of... Um, family uh, gene pool 
um, because it's going to be very difficult to match a thin face like Alan's. <coughs> oh God, what am I doing? A thin face like Alan's with um, a, a face like um, Keith's. Yeah. <laughs> The mummies were discovered more than a decade ago um, below the remnants um, of the houses at Callahallen. These are all under those three houses at Callahallen. We're going to be particularly looking at this lady rather than the other one. A prehistoric village on the island of South Uist that, that we know had hundreds and hundreds um, of villages at one point. Now, it's difficult to work out that the male one of the two that has been made up of composite parts of the four mummies um, at the site, um, that could be that could have been buried um, after six hundred years. So this person that you've got displayed in your home is buried a considerably length of time after the original person had passed away. And what does that mean? The person who is in your building for that long long period of time was so cherished. You can explain it as the same as a Roman Samian ware bowl, still on the table of an Anglo-Saxon 600 years after that Samian ware bowl had been made. It's so cherished and loved that there's not even a chip in it, right? But they now, members of the same family, wouldn't Now, this, this, is a, this is where DNA comes in. All the DNA needs to be really looked at. And what we don't have... <laughs> is the DNA of the people that were living um, at the point that the body was laid into the ground. Now, all these questions are really important, but they still need to be answered. But there is a massive important point here. Forget about the head bit still, right? We want to go down another journey. In the Neolithic period, generations and generations before, the period that we're talking about now is the Bronze Age, 3,600 3, years ago, the Neolithic period, we're, we're talking in excess of 4,500 years ago. There's a bit of a, a, a gap, right? But in the Neolithic period, in the Neolithic period, they, they, they believed in the sense of um, um, spirit or ancestor space. Uh, and Kathy, Kathy and I experienced a bit of this when we went underground um, with Martin Carruthers in um, Orkney. When, when we went underground with Martin, um, he, he basically said, the reason you, you go underground, right, and you, you've got a stone above you, you've got um, stone supporting it, right, and you've got, you've got a stone wall underneath here, and there's a gap there, there's a gap there, there's a gap there, and there's a gap there, right? And I think it was either you, Cathy, or I asked, why is there a gap? Why, why are we seeing earth there? Why are we seeing earth there? And Martin simply said, it's because that's where the ancestors are. The ancestors are in the earth. That's why there's a space. There's a space to go in there and say, look, I am not happy. Why won't you help me? And you, you, you put all this information into this hole and you sit there and you contemplate and maybe you might get the answer on the ground, right? That, that's just one example. Another example is that in the Neolithic period, you've got something known as bank barrows. The best example of a bank barrow is Barclays. No, the best example of a bank bar barrow is at Maiden Castle where there's a 400 metre long bank barrow at Maiden Castle, right? I think it's 400 metres. And it's just, it's just a mound of earth from one end to the next. There's nothing seemingly in it. It's just a mound of earth. And you've also got Cursus Monuments, for example, at Stonehenge. The Cursus Monument is basically uh, a long sausage, right, um, with a space in the middle. So basically it's, it's a bank, um, an endless bank with no break in it, right, um, um, it's a raised bank and there's the, the, the space in the middle is the same um, depth as the space outside. So in other words, it's a bank that protects this inner space, right? We don't find anything in the inner space when these, when these curses monuments were, were, were constructed, right? And the archaeologists have thought, why? And the reason why um, the ancestor lived in these spaces they lived inside the bank barrow. That's where you don't find anything in them. They, this, this was their ground. And we know that these are sacred spaces because nobody puts anything in them. There's no flint, there's no bones. They're absolutely clear later on their stuff. But when they're built, we know they're respected. Before you ask the question, how do we know that they thought their ancestors lived in there? Well, they left them alone. There's nothing in them. There's no evidence of anything being used. That meant for a long period of time, our ancestors left that space while they found all the land around it and they buried people and they, they had all these wonderful things, that space. It was, it was that space. 
an actual demarcated space uh, that you had to revere. You couldn't touch it, you couldn't even think of going anywhere near it, right? And it's very similar to um, who these people were, these mummified people. They were very revered. Obviously, 600 years later, 300 years later, when these bodies were placed into the ground, the original purpose of why they were in the room has been lost. The original name of that person, unless oral history have told us that their name was Eric 600 years earlier, right? That name could have been lost. Other people could have moved into that building. DNA, we need to look at all that, but we haven't done it yet, right? So we need to find those other bodies. Um, and the point is they, they are revealed and special people, right? There's, a, there's almost as if there's a barrier around them. It's the same as a war memorial today, right? I know they're a bad example. 99% of all war memorials have never seen any graffiti, never seen anyone urinating them against them. Um, haven't seen any damage, haven't seen anyone with spray cans. 99% over the past 100 years have not been touched by thugs, drug, drug addicts, people, people on the P or whatever. They've done nothing to them because they revere those monuments. It's the same as that person. It's the same as those curses monuments. So that tradition of revering something, but not really understanding why we revere it. We have, Jane, the question is, do we understand what's going on? They probably didn't. The person who originally mm -hmm. thought of Stonehenge, Stonehenge was originally um, a causeway enclosure site 6,000 years ago. Uh, then it was a henge monument. Then it was the Stonehenge and all the rest of it. The person who thought what's going to happen with Stonehenge 6,000 years ago had no idea what was going to eventually happen with Stonehenge 4,000 years ago. Right? It's a 2,000 year gap. Right? It's the same as a cathedral today. The original purpose of, of a modern day cathedral in Britain was not for um, the Protestants, right? Not for this sort of Protestantism, it was for Catholicism, which had a different, completely different way of looking at cathedrals. So a thousand years old, they're used by Protestants, and the Protestants don't have a, um, the foggiest of, of, of what the true principles of everything these buildings are, even though some of it's written down, some of that information is lost, but that's a thousand years. So the point is that these bodies have, have got an interesting meaning, um, and a special meaning in the past. So, um, based on the condition and structures of the skeleton, scientists have previously determined that the bodies have been placed in a peat bog just long enough to preserve them, and then they are removed out of the peat bog. Only a few months. And the skeletons um, were then reburied hundreds and hundreds of years later. But they're enough that to actually have these surviving 300 years later, whole hand surviving 300 years later, is a really difficult concept to try and get your mind around how this survived with children running around, even, even if you've got some kind of bandaging around the fingers, even if it's in some kind of a bag, even if it's a caked in something. But I tell you what, my, uh, my, my, my crow would fly over and try and nick one of the fingers, would rest on the fingers, right? And, and so on and so on. How this has survived 300 years, I have no idea. Um, what, what they're saying is that um, the clues of... The, the clues that these bog bodies were more than they seemed uh, is where we're going. That's what the article says here, and that's where we're going now. On the female skeleton, the jaw didn't fit um, properly into the rest of the skull. Um, now Professor Mike Parker Pearson, then Sheffield University. Um, could we try to work this out through DNA testing? That's what they did. They, they took a sample of DNA from the jawbone to the skull to the arm and realised that the DNA was all slightly different. The result shows that bones came from different people um, and none of them even shared the same mother. But then again, they could be some from the same family because they could have shared the same uh, um, fathers or, or uncles or whatever. We can't really judge the family on modern day parameters. Um, but then again, we could because um, People have step, people have, adopt children and they're then part of the family, but they're not part, they're not the same DNA. So don't be questioning me on this. Different ways of looking at family in the past. What was family in the past? We don't really know. Did did everybody know that um, that that child is actually of that father or the other father? If the mother slept around a bit, that happens today in modern day society. I, I came across this guy once. His wife said that his four children. Uh, were his when in fact none of them were but he accepted those four children as his because his wife told him so the concept of family is to be seen like this 
Um, the, the female is made from body, body parts at different periods that we know hundreds of years ap apart. Quick dip in the bog, as, in other words. Another clue to the odd nature of Callahallan mummies is their unusual well-preserved bones. Again, we did that example of the well-preserved bones. Keith's bones, if they were immediately buried in the ground, would, would, would not really be in much of a state after 3,600 years. A peat bog is high acid, sad, acidic, low oxygen environment, which inhibits and kills the bacteria that breaks down all those organs, all the calcium and all the rest of it. But these were experts. And why, why, are, these, why are these bog bodies different from, from normal bog bodies, peat marsh and all the rest of it, Lindo Man, uh, the, body, the twins from Ireland, the bodies from uh, Denmark and all the rest of it. And why, why are these bog bodies different? <clears throat> when you put, when um, Alan, uh, we're just going to grot you and kill you and put you in a bog. We'll never see you again. Job done. Thank we'll you. never get you out. Right? That's Alan dealt with. Right? Don't really want to know him anymore. Mm -hmm. you know. I'll have to dig you out, Alan, because I'm going to get the rest of the money out of you for the trips. Um, anyway, <coughs> but the point is, Alan, right? If you're a normal bog body, we got rid of you. We're never going to see you again. The difference between your bog body. And Keith bog body is that Keith is brought back out, out of the bog within a few months, and they're displayed in front of us. You're never to be seen again. That's right. Yeah. I can't swap over roles. Look, I, you know, I don't dress up as a woman on TV and say this isn't fair, do I? You know, I get on with it. Michelle reckons I enjoy it, particularly when she turns up some days and I'm in her clothes. But uh, that's not the point, okay? You can't have it all, Alan. All right? Don't worry, Alan. I'll make you feel a bit better in a short while. Um, so, they can't wait. They can't wait. So, in the Callahallan bodies, the bones are still articulated, attached to each other as they would be in life. Key. This suggests that the barriers. Um, remove the bodies before the acid really got at them. When the mummies were later reburied in soil, the soft tissue again began to break down, but your bones remained forever. Okay, to make this fair, we dug, we dug Alan out, put him on display in the museum, and people sit there with their ice lollies licking them, looking at Ali's, uh, um, Alan's naked remains. Oh, brilliant. Good. Yeah. Um, you can imagine Andrea there s sat there looking at your naked body licking an ice lolly you'd be really happy wouldn't you <laughs> she's into that type of thing aren't you <laughs> um, so the researchers aren't sure why the villagers went through this unusual process we will never know but it's a very very complicated process a cynical theory may be that um, you, you wanted this thing about the head um after a after hundred years, um, the head fell off. So they decided oh. the next person to die, which was a, um, <coughs> we would say take their head off um, and just put it on the rest of the body, um, stuck it back on. Um, and, and, but that is, the, the problem is maybe the head dropped off and they got another head to stick on it, right? That's not as simple as it sounds, right? <laughs> and the reason why it's not as simple as it sounds is back to this, right? There seemed to be no damage to the vertebra uh, from the re-erecting of the skull onto this body. So meaning that they didn't get a bit of wood and just, yeah, that'll do, right? That obviously didn't happen. These people were experts at what they were doing. Maybe somehow they were able to sew the soft tissues of, of the skull onto the top um, t uh, tissues of the rest of the torso. But we haven't got that evidence because that's rotted away. But there isn't this sort of, maybe we're going to stick it back on. It was a really complicated process. And then later on, in what it must have been, right, he was so gobsmacked, his head was joined onto your body, right? So he's like this. All right. He's completely shocked. You can't get rid of this oaf. You know what I mean? Yeah? So, um, so you're completely shocked, right? And a long time, long time in the lane, right? Your jaw falls out and you add the other jaw. But there's one problem with the, even all that theory, right? 
if, 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 as they're so careful with the body in the first place, right, how would they have allowed their head to fall off? Surely the fingers would have gone first. Well, you know, the bag, yeah. so the head's at the top, and if you open the bag, and I'll open it here, yeah, it's still all right. So you've opened the bag so often that the top of the head's deteriorated, and you've got the chance of spins are up. So chuck it and put a fresh one on. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that explanation. Um, but the, the fact is, funny, you know it's not as simple as just chucking a head back on because the, it's, all, it's all in a really good state of preservation, right? So something else is going on there that we don't really understand. But that was a good interpretation there, Cathy. Thank you. Another possibility is that the emerging was deliberate to create a symbolic ancestor that literally embodied traits from multiple lineages. Yeah, I like now that makes more sense. There's a bit more care there, isn't there, Kathy, over these other sort of little theories. Right? There's a little bit more care. That means they've thrown away the other body though, doesn't it? The one that the heads come from. Oh, why do you have to be bloody awkward? Yeah, what have they done with that one? Why aren't they revering that one? Care hang on, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. There, there's a few bits here, right? There are a few bits, right? And bits in the bits. How do we know there wasn't another composite mummy from the other parts, right? But we haven't found those remains. Now there's a curveball if I've ever seen one. But if it's a family member and, you're in there and the original person is related, then it would, to me that would be okay. Yes, so obviously you get rid of the head, you bury the head respectfully somewhere um, with the body of the other person and you put their head onto the new body. That would make sense that would make lots of sense but there's a really careful um, subtlety about this practice not just the exposing of the body so and the other it, it's there's a lot there's and to remember this is in a roundhouse right uh, or um, a house um, that was sim sim simply didn't have the modern day um, wares and where for alls of central heating and sort of ventilation and all the rest of it but it obviously telling us that their homes were a, a, a lot better built than ours lasting that long period of time. And bodies lasting a long period of time. So um, if we want to compare, um, if we want to compare Brun Jane and everybody else in the, uh, there a minute, when we look at the um, Chinchoro people of South America, the Chinchoro people of the Chile, Chilean Andes, what we see is sets of human remains, forget about... <coughs> children's bodies being we're talking about chinchoro mummies okay what they've done as bits of the body are starting to decay we're not saying anything's decaying here because we don't have that decay in evidence right but as bits of the body start to fall off oh yeah. fell off. Fell off. as as bits of the body start to fall off they start to add animal hair on they start to add sea lion skin uh, onto the bones that are exposed. They add sticks and grass onto the body to keep the body in the present. Oh, there's also another example there. The Day of the Dead on some of those weird um, Caribbean islands yeah. where you dig up your ancestors, you bring them out, you put them on chairs, you talk to them, you make them drink. It's one of those Hollywood things. You give, you give a, a body something to drink and it water spurts out all the... Yeah, that's what's going on as well. The Day of the Dead, right? They get, the, these bodies are getting so sozzled, um, they've got so much whiskey in their body, that it preserves them, and they're able to dig them up the next year. It's the same process. It's the very, very same process. Uh, um, this, um, I, I, I've, um, my, my grandmother passed away um, earlier part of the year, and I, I've, actually, I've actually still got her uh, wedding ring with me, um, which I carry around all the time. Um, uh, my my nan was a wonderful woman of great wisdom. Uh, in her, in her last in her last days, everyone would say, "Oh, your nan's not making any sense." And then she would turn around and she would um, say something to me, and we'd be able to have these wonderful conversations. And I was still going to her for advice in her last days, um, and that that ring itself w was actually still on my nan's finger when she passed away, and it's not been cleaned or anything, and I keep that with me. And, and that ring reminds me of my nan. Um, but we, we, we all do it in some way, whether it's in our mind or we have a, we, we have a limb. Um, we, none of us carry around limbs of our loved ones with us, except Kathy, but, uh, uh, um, or we carry a photograph with us. It seems the person um, 
one thing that we can say is are these people special people um well 300 years later how would you know that they were special in the first place so there's something else going on there um were they famous people that they they, they won a battle we don't know we, 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 what was this person i think what it is is is, is the link with the, with the landscape these people remember were in these buildings and must have been in these buildings for a long time after they've been built and why well it's quite simple you chuck a body you put a body outside right sit sit it on a bench outside and the first thing that's going to happen birds are going to start plucking out its hair right uh, a, a, a wild dog might come in run off with a limb and all the rest of it even though it's been properly treated and and it starts to decay so these bodies are within that building for a lo very long time um is the actual original body important or, or the sense of the creation more important the sense of the creation is more important uh, the image um, and the identity of what this is rather than the individual is more important because it's it's a set of composite bodies um, and what we've done Alan we've brought you out the ground we've not messed around with your body and you, you could just hang around yeah because you know um, when when scientists study the DNA of very ancient remains they sample only one part of the body if they had done that at the bodies of Callahan, they probably would have worked out that they were mummified, but they would not have worked out completely that they were from different mummies. Even though the jaws look slightly different, the, the cop out for the archaeologists to get their job done quickly um, and just say, well, we've got a mummified body, right? And that's the way we're going to do it. Um, it is say, for example, um, I, um, I, I don't know if they go to this extent, but say, for example, you found two bodies at Waterloo in a ditch. And you've got one head over here and you've got one head over here. You've got a length of body here and you've got a length of body here. Does anyone actually go to the effort of working at that skull actually belongs to this side? And that skull belongs to that side. Nobody actually does that. <coughs> yeah, it's all disarticulated. In, in the sense of a battle, what we do... We presume, we presume that everything in the, in the ground, you know, when, when people are on a battlefield, right, you, and this does happen, you've got a head over here, and you've got a body over here. I'm sure they did it in the First World War. Right, that head has got to belong to this body. But in fact, there's a, the body of this person buried here, and the head's all the way over there. So we put them two together, and we bury them. It turns out that that head was from a German soldier and this head was from a French soldier never to be buried ever but they were buried together people didn't go through this effort and maybe we should go through this effort more when we look at the archaeology um, so if you if you go back in time and understand what these composites are um, I think you'd, you'd have to go back in time when the rituals uh, were it says here when the rituals were more bizarre but I think it should be saying I think you have to go back in time to understand that these rituals are normal uh, back into the un unrecorded depths of time and what we do see about these bodies uh, is that it's more common than we thought Mike Parker Pearson originally said he said right that this is unique but he decided to do his PhD on a British scale and he found other examples of Bronze Age bodies that showed the same type of evidence as we're finding at Callahan. And I use the word evidence with a, an, with a line underneath it because there's a certain meaning for that word evidence that we're going to do after the break. So I'd like to show you a few more images and then hopefully then you'll help me out now. See, Lynn did that for us. That is a plan of these buildings. The other plan was a bit sort of um, faint. So, um, so what we have, we have our, um, we have our young lady buried here, the one that we've seen. We have two burials here. It's not showing it, but there's two burials here. That's a half. There's actually two. But in fact, there's a dog and a, and, um, a, some other human remains there. There's another burial here, and there may have been another burial here that's been lost. There are three buildings here, which, which, which are dedicated to being a Bronze Age terrace. 
Um, <coughs> and we haven't really excavated what's on this side. The similarity before Kathy jumps in there straight with her undies is that there are some similarities between this and Scarabray, but Scarabray's 1,000 plus years earlier, 1,500 years earlier. Uh, you've got a bit of a workshop going on over here as well. Remember that workshop of Scarabray Cafe? Eighth building. Um, and with Scarabray, you had terrace buildings and sort of subterranean streets and stuff. Um, but lots of the buildings of Scarabray are linked together, so that's the similarity here, and the workshop building over there as well. Um, so we've got hearths in the middle, and these people are buried. But just think about this whole... It, it's difficult for me to try and work out how these people could have been in these buildings for that length of time. And we just cannot answer that. And maybe that's another class altogether. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to do now is show you one more image, and we will take a break. <coughs> So here we go. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six sets of human remains and a dog's body as well. So that really screws it up. Right, now if you want to look at this sensibly, there's one set of remains in there, okay? There are... Um, How are the remains complete? Um, that's been disarticulated. Complete, 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 complete. But you, you interrupted at the probably the wrong time there, but that's a good question. They are complete. Um, that's that's been damaged probably because of the other actions of these burials. So technically, right? I'd be very careful with my wording here. That's um, that's not an eight, that's not um, that's not really um, a completely immature body, right? Um, but you've got two, two set, you've got three sets of remains in here, but you could count them as two sets of remains, because that set of remains there is a three-year-old, a three-month-old child. So try and get my mind set around this. Two adult remains in there, but there's one child. Two fairly adult remains here, no children, and probably two down here as well. The reason why I'm a bit sketchy on this set of child's remains, ba baby's remains, is that it's a special case. We're going to treat it as a special case. This child didn't last long. Three months, it didn't last long at all. But that sort of, uh, that gives you the sense of that is our lady that we've seen a few images of. That's the one with the flexed hands. We're not going there again, Andrea. Um, and what we're going to do now, we're going to take a break. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, um they I'm not answering that question because I don't know the answer. I don't think they've really gone. I don't think they've. Re they, they, they were still. They probably have got dating for that, but I haven't got it with us today. The so focus on one of the bodies said it's female, made up of three bodies. Three, three, females. three female bodies. Yes. So they must have deliberately put females with females. Yes. And they so they must have known that the oldest one was Auntie Maud, and they kept her that she's Auntie Maud, and then yes. added. Somebody else or another so woman who's very important to the mission. Yeah, so so they are, they are, it, there, there is one, uh, um, a, a female skull is a lot more narrower than, than a male skull. It's got a completely different structure. The, the teeth work slightly, slightly different. In, Bigger but, bones. Yes, and, and so this is why you've got, you've got to get like for like. So not only are you dead, Keith, mm -hmm. you're also a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Was there an island during that period or was it connected to the mainland? Uh, it was it was an island. Yeah, yeah. 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 I wouldn't have much relevance here, but it's still an it's still an island. Any other questions before we take a break? No? Okay, let, let's take a break now, folks. Next week, please. Yeah, okay, I'll give it back. Well, okay. Right, so carry on with, with this. I mean, somebody who What's this? What are you talking David about? Bellamy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got, I got, I got a bit. So they examined all of them to see if they are mixes of people. Yes, they have all four of the mummified ones, particularly, and then you've got the the other two, and you've got the dog. To be honest with you, this this is this is very very complex work that we're actually looking at. So um, I just want to get move through these um, images now on the screen and. <coughs> So what we've got here, 
So again, back to this um, original slide where uh, you've got the, 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 mummy, the sense of mummification um, and you've got the, these row of buildings, um, the sense of place within the landscape, uh, the, the, the recovery of the archaeology there in the first place, uh, the sequence of DNA, the, the work of Mike Parker Pearson, and the bit of evidence that told you uh, that we truly have um, mummified sets of human remains. That's the piece that we need to go on to. I'm just going to skip through my slides a minute to make sure I've done everything. And I want to do a, that article, which will give it justice. Right, okay. Right, here we go. Um, I wasn't going to use that one. I was going to use the one that was the other one. So if we can have that as a headlines in the background. There we go. Um, and what I'm going to do is turn to what I've got on my screen, the wonders of, of, of Lynn being in the room, because she really helps me out sometimes. It really helps things work properly. Right, good. So this is the, this is the updated stuff um, from 2015. And the wonderful thing was when, uh, when I was uh, with the University of Highlands and Islands is, is this, they, they were still really using this as uh, wonderful teaching information to tell us the wonderful uh, finds that had been made at South Uist as, as part of the um, um, information range of the um, Highlands and Islands University. So, solve the mystery of Britain's Bronze Age mummies. So these, these are being found um, um, less than a decade before 2015. But by 2015, we're, we're really understanding um, what these mummies are about and how we came to the conclusion that the mummies themselves have been mummied because there's a certain piece of information I haven't given you yet. Whenever mummies are mentioned, our imagination strays um, to the dusty tombs and gilded relics of ancient Egyptian burial sites. With their eerily lifelike repose, the preserved bodies of ancient pharaohs like Hatshepsut and Ta um, um, Tutankhamun steer our imaginations and stroke um, the, the very uh, brain cells that we have to give an interest in these people and cultures that have long since passed away. Um, and again, that's what we think about mummification. So when I said mummific mummification today, you probably thought, right, we're going to look at mummies that are like the ones in ancient Egypt. But there are lots of different types of mummies around the world. To be honest with you, um, if you want to look up on, on your computer what... Um, what the word mummies means it basically says anything uh, that's been preserved in a way that you actually find flesh and, um, uh, and everything so basically bog bodies comes under the category of mummies these come under the category of mummies the ones in ancient Egypt the one, one from the Incan civilization come under the category of mummies those mummies of, of monks and priests that are found um, in churches around Rome and all the rest of it those those mummies of monks that are pinned upon walls, right? Those are mummies. But the ancient Egyptians weren't the only ones um, to put mummification um, out there, as we've already explained. As it happens, mummies dating back to the Bronze Age between 4,200 and 2,700 years ago have been discovered in Britain, and only very recently, um, starting with the finds at Kalahari. But until recently, we knew very little about how mummification was practiced by ancient British societies, or to what extent. So when Mike Parker Pearson was working at uh, the site of Kalahari, he, he really believed that uh, these were the only examples ever. But because he was doing his PhD at the time, he, he basically what he wanted to do was to um, use other examples, look at other examples, how mummies work across Britain and elsewhere. And he gave us some really intriguing information. So finding out how peat bogs and bacteria affect the body after death. This helped to unravel some of the mysteries surrounding Britain's Bronze Age burial and mummies. I first learned that mummification may have been practised in Britain back in 2008, while a student at Sheffield. Mike Parker Pearson gave a lecture on the evidence for mummification based on skeletons he had excavated at the site of Kalahallan on South Uist in the Outer Hebrides. Mummy bundles. 
several lines of evidence came together to suggest, rather controversially, that these skeletons had, had once been perfectly, uh, purposefully mummied. And I would say perfectly mummied as well. The tightly, um, the tightly um, flexed um, positions of skeletons were, were like Peruvian mummy bum bundles. The word flexed usually either means that a body is laid out right or tightly flexed, banged together. But this is a, this, these are all uh, where the bones are all integral, articulated. And two teeth, part of the wrist and the knee of one of the Kalahala skeletons, had been removed long after they had died, which suggests that the bodies had been curated for an extended length of time. So in other words, um, what we're talking about, that's in the case of the male example. We haven't mentioned, we've just been mentioned the female example. So the, these, these are bodies that have been nicely melded together. Okay. The radiocarbon uh, dates from one of the skeletons were older than the dates obtained from the sediments at the burial site, our female example. This suggests that the bodies may have been buried centuries after they had died. Um, a, th a thorough physical examination together with the DNA analysis showed that both skeletons had actually been constructed from the mummified parts of several individuals. We already know that, but the information you don't know is coming up. Of course, based on this evidence alone, it was possible that these mummies were outliers. He thought that these were unique. Through research, he found out he was wrong. And it's the only time I've known that Mike Parker Pearson has ever said he was wrong. Mummification could have, have been a fringe practice carried out by people living on the peripheries of British Bronze Age society. But he went out there and found the evidence, so I'll give him the credit where it's due. Uh, that, that's, that's, one of, that's one of the wonderful things about doing work for a university. You've got access to any archive anywhere. It, it was great being in the basement of um, um, the Carinian Museum in Cyrencester with, with all these really valuable objects with nobody else in the room going through everything and thinking, right, I can, I can work out what this is and that is. And this, this, is, this is the nature of research. You're able to handle things that none of us usually are ever allowed to get near. The problem is that the same evidence from Callahan might not, not necessarily be found at sites where mummification was practiced. Radiocarbon dates would not always have been um, the precision needed to identify significant delays between a person's death and their burial. Because sometimes carbon dating gives you an approximate date, not a, not a finite date. And there was no guarantee that the extensive meddling with mummified body parts identified at Callahan was practiced elsewhere. So... It was Mike Parker Pearson's challenge to identify whether remains from other sites might have been mummies too in the Bronze Age and other periods in time. And he was going to have to get his hands dirty. And this was the clue. This was the clue. Microscopic, microscopic death tunnels. Um, after we die, I'm out. Our gut bacteria circulates around our body through our blood vessels and begins to decompose our soft tissues. Tissues. So this in the ground, right? Um, uh, the the gut acid would go go through all the um, um, go through the body and then actually, um, after it's eaten away at the flesh and started putrefying everything, you know, you're you're now rank now. You really stink, right? So this is the putrefaction going on, and then. That actually, the acid starts to go into the bone, causing pitting. Hand down. Thank you. Uh, these bacteria also get into our bones and begin to eat away at the proteins, producing microscopic tunnels. So the vesicles in the bone itself, um, the bacteria goes in there and starts to open them up and they get busy, bi bi bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you start to get great pitting and your bone structure starts to collapse. Uh, these, these are referred to as microscopic tunnels. Most of the bones from, from bodies that have been buried in the ground soon after death are filled with these tunnels because the skeleton is essentially trapped in an enclosed environment with destructive bi bacteria. Now, forget you, over to Alan. Little or no tunneling was observed within the skeleton from Kalahalan, suggesting that their putrefaction had been interrupted. You had been interrupted for the first time in your life, Alan. 
Methods of mummification usually involve killing or removing gut bacteria soon after a person dies in order to prevent this process. So, you are placed in a bog. So, studying the extent of bacteria action inside bones was a uh, potentially a new way of identifying skeletons which had previously been mummified. And what we're going to do, look at this there. Okay, so this, this is itself is, is sort of a, a fairly normal um, image of bones that have been mummified. But if they weren't mummified in your case, these are going to be quite extensive. It's almost, you're going to be able to put pins in there, right? Mm. Be, it, it's, the bacteria is really eking away. Uh, I remember we excavated a bone, um, a human um, ulna from um, St. Bride's Major, and the, the bone was so pitted that as we excavated it, it fell apart. We had to glue the whole thing together because that had been deliberately buried. Um, so go look, looking at this, um, if we go down there, to test this theory, examine the bone uh, microstructure of two uh, bona fide mummies. Both skeletons showed little or no bacteria attack confirming that this pattern was consistent with mummification. I then looked at bacterial tunneling in bones all over Britain. Uh, 300 sets of human remains over Britain, which is a lot of human remains to be looking at, to be honest with you. Each museum you go into, they get one out at a time, and you've got to examine it. That goes away. It must have taken him ages to do. Uh, as expected, almost all bones from most periods were filled with bacterial tunneling. Most but around half of the samples that dated back to the Bronze Age showed little or no sign of bacterial tunneling. Alan, you don't have bacterial tunneling. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Good. You do, though, so you're a pleb. <laughs> the Bronze Age skeleton, uh, which bore this signature, came from sites located not just in Scotland, in South Uist, but all over Britain, you know, northwest Scotland, to South East England. So the Bronze Age, they're doing this mummification. It's widespread. It's not just, we don't have special people living on the um, South US islands. They are all over the place in the Bronze Age. So this is evidence that mummification was practiced all over Britain. Uh, this is why we get so many good Bronze Age bones. We don't get many bones being found in the Iron Age. But that is for another day. Uh, now this is the other thing as well is um, points to points to in uh, the inhibition of the bacteria attacking the bones. There are other processes as well. But burned or buried, the ones that Callan and Alan have, have put in the bog, but there are other examples. Some of these skeletons even hint at the process that Bronze Age people may have used to mummify their dead. The Callan bones look like they had been eroded by acid, so they've been placed in a bog. Um, and then taken out of the bog, um, after a few months, and then we've got the other processes to keep all the bits and pieces there. We're not going to be long, Jane. In contrast, Bronze Age mummies from Kent were discoloured in a way which suggests that they had been burnt uh, to inhibit um, the bacterial tunneling, being basically the bodies have been smoked. Smoked mummies. So you've got all the organs and stuff in there, and so they've been smoked. It is impossible to say for sure exactly why Bronze Age Britons did this. The evidence suggests that Bronze uh, Age people uh, kept their mummies above ground for a number of years or even decades. Quite the opposite to the practices in ancient Egypt where they are placed underground. Now this is key, these last two paragraphs and then we're finished. Both ancient and uh, present societies which keep their mummified dead close tend to view them as being alive. When I said this to everybody in my... Um, in my Skype class, all nine of them, everyone said, oh, dude, that can't be the case. But I said, Mike Parker Pearson is saying it, and I agree with it. So we feel that Alan is still alive and Keith is still alive in your mummified state, not the other state. Right. But, you know, but in some sense, um, we're able to communicate and talk to you. The bodies we use to communicate with ancestors in the afterlife, even today, human remains are innately powerful objects which can be leveraged for political or social purposes. Um, in the example of Lenin's mummified remains. And this is key, so last paragraph. We might even reasonably guess that Bronze Age people used the mummies of their ancestors to exert rights over land, resources, and power. The next step 
will be to examine whether mummification was practiced even further afield, perhaps in mainland Europe, and that's more for research. What I'm going to do, are there any questions today? No questions? Oh, that must have been quite comprehensive. Um, Ellen, if you've got a minute, I want you to see, um, see these little objects. But um, everybody else, are you all here next week? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll have an answer. What's going to happen on uh, 2nd January next week? Again, if you're any, any interest in any of the other trips and stuff, you've now got the sheet. You need to read through it. Let me know next week. Thank you very much. Thank have you, you all enjoyed much. today? Good. Good, good, good. Get them off.